we often throw these words around, uh, you know, Japanese internment. And I'd, I'd like to know how you describe what happened to Japanese Americans during that time. What is the language you use to describe that? Yeah, great, great question. Because um, the people, when I speak, they, they, they oftentimes notice I don't, I rarely use the term internment. That, um, and what I usually say, the Japanese American incarceration. And the reason I do that is, um, you know, internment is a, a more technical legal term that was used to round up and, uh, you know, give hearings to uh, Japanese nationals, Italian nationals, and German nationals. And this was under the you know, War Powers Act. And it, it's kind of similar to the process that en enemy combatants do when they go to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, but there is this sort of legal process. Um, and that happened to several thousand you know, Japanese uh, men primarily. But after that, um, you know, under executive order, presidential executive order, uh, you know, FDR signed uh, Executive Order 9066, which then started the process where the rest of the community on the West Coast was rounded up. And these were um, predominantly U.S. citizens and people who had uh, done nothing wrong. And in this process, there were no hearings, no trials. Uh, it was based just on their race. And they were then placed in these concentration camps. And, and that's why I, I, I generally call the whole process the Japanese American incarceration, because most people that were impacted were U.S. citizens, and they weren't actually formally interned. And so that's kind of how I, I look at this. And, and so when we talk about the 120,000 Japanese Americans, um, they were in what were called war relocation authority camps, which were not internment camps uh, technically. Nice. And so when we, we did the end show, we were doing oral histories, and we interviewed, you know, Frank, uh, who was, um, he was about 12 or 13 when the war broke out. And so he was uh, kind of, uh, 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 you know, kind of an adolescent. And his father was a community leader. So on December 8th, the FBI came and removed his father and brought him to a Department of Justice camp. And so the um, you know, family had to fend for themselves without their father. And uh, uh, Frank and his mother and his siblings went to the Tulu Lake concentration camp in California, and his dad was at uh, you know, Santa Fe uh, Department of Justice. And so they were separated for about four years. Um, and towards the end of the war, uh, and Frank's talking about this, they get word that their father is going to be um, you know, released from the Department of Justice camp and reunited with the family. And Frank is, is, is telling the stories, oh, this is so exciting. You know, Dad's coming back, he said, and and uh, he's waiting at the fence, you know, uh, you know, at the gate. And uh, when he comes, you know, he he brings the uh, picks up his uh, luggage and they bring it to the uh, you know, the family barrack. And in the family barrack, the uh, family's all there waiting with friends, you know, because they're all so excited to see, you know, Frank's uh, father. And uh, you know, Frank's um, you know father is you know, a little tired and you know he's lost a lot of weight uh, but he's really you know glad to see everyone and so he goes around and frank's telling the story so he sees so and so and it's oh how are you doing it's great and and uh, and he's you know, smiling and laughing and goes around the room and then he comes to you know frank you know frank's the next person you know his son and he looks at frank and and the the dad looks at him and says so so who's this boy i don't recognize him and and Frank, when he said that, you know, I still remember it because this is that power, power of the video. You could see his face just drop and, and tears come to his eyes. And so for me, that was, you know, that moment when I just knew how powerful these stories could be and how important it was to actually see that expression. Wow. And, and Frank talked about how, you know, there, and I remember I could hear him say this. He said, you know, when you, we went to camp, you know, sure, we lost a lot of things. You know, the, you know, we lost our house. We lost a lot of, of personal items, material things. But he says the thing that really hurt the most was, you know, that loss with his father, that, you know, he didn't recognize him, that, you know, Frank had, you know, gone from 12 to about 16. So he said, you know, I grew like six inches. My features changed. So, yeah, he changed quite a bit. But that his father, you know, wasn't there for that. And, and Frank would say, so that's really for him, the impact of 
of camp. It was the loss of family at a really critical time for him. And, uh, and he said how lost he felt after that. He just really, um, you know, said his path was one that, you know, esteem issues and, and getting in trouble because he just felt like he was lost at that point. Um, so that's kind of a story that um, sometimes we, we think about the physical hardships, but, but the ones that really, I think, are the most moving to me are those emotional, psychological losses that people have. That is such a powerful story and that I just want <clears throat> to let just sit there without any further comment. That is so moving, Tom. Um, and I think we can all feel compassion for him. And, and also for, I think about the dad too, in that situation, the moment he realized how, how his own disorientation and tiredness and the four years of incarceration at a different camp then impacted his son. Yeah. I'm sure that he, 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 he saw the, the, the change in his son's face that saw the face uh, respond to that situation. And I'm sure that dad carried that yeah. the rest of his life too. It's so difficult for human beings, isn't it? To believe that our past actions are not ideal, that our, parents' behaviors or grandparents' behaviors or communities' behaviors are not ideal. And then there's also in that lack of, of willingness to, to confess a mistake, you know, a terrible one, um, there's a lack of trust in the community that's been wronged, you know, to, to be willing to, to offer after recompense has been, after restitution has been made, you know, for there to be a kind of, a kind of forgiveness uh, that can then heal the community that's very difficult for human beings to do. Mm -hmm. And yet that's kind of a, a success story of America. I, I think I mentioned earlier about the, I, I, I talk about sometimes the exceptionalism of America. And you know, the United States, and, and to their credit, the US government did this remarkable thing in the 80s where they um, opened up the, what happened, the history and said, um, you know, the Japanese American community feels like they were wronged. So let's actually take a look at this. And they uh, created the commission uh, and uh, they did a lot of you know, research over years and presented to Congress. And Congress agreed with it, you know, that, um, that uh, the Japanese American community was wronged. Uh, President Ronald Reagan signed uh, the, um, the, you know, this, the redress bill, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, and offered an apology and restitution to Japanese Americans. That was, that was un, very unusual for the United States. And you're, you're right, it's so, so hard. I think we need to start, we need to look at that for things like African Americans and, and slavery. And I'm not proposing necessarily that they get reparations or I'm not sure what the solution is, but to have that conversation, to really bring the, the parties together, to really open up and and to be as open and compassionate as we can, because we keep coming back. We we all know the the systemic historic racism of our of our country, and it feels like you know some of these really deep wounds have to be healed, and and they won't happen until we have these these conversations. I I totally agree with all of that, and I it, it must be it must have been so weird then. To, to see when the Supreme Court upheld the Muslim ban, mm -hmm. that they took that very moment of basically, you know, basically doing the same thing the Korematsu decision did in upholding the US government's right to, to put Japanese Americans in, in, in incarceration, uh, to, then, to then apologize and, and rescind that decision while upholding the very same kind of logic uh, in, in, in upholding the Muslim ban. Like, what was that like for you and for other Japanese Americans? Yeah, so, yeah, just a, a little background. So the Korematsu case, uh, a case of Fred Korematsu, where he challenged the, uh, the government's orders to put Japanese Americans in camps. His case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and the court ruled six to three in favor of the government, saying that in times of war, um, 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 the government said that there was a military necessity and in times of war, 
uh, we have to give deference to the government to make these decisions. So with a six to three ruling, the Supreme Court upheld Korematsu. The, the moment they did that, legal scholars uh, raised red flags. They said, this really goes against the constitution. This is uh, uh, something that they don't agree with. I think there were legal scholars literally months after in some of the legal journals, you know, challenging it. And, and over time, Korematsu has been viewed as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions uh, you know, made. And so that's always been out there. It's been a sore spot for, for um, uh, Japanese Americans. And then as you mentioned uh, recently, more recently, about two years ago, the Supreme Court ruled on the Muslim travel ban. And this is where there were um, um, a, a ban on travel and immigration from predominantly Muslim uh, countries. And from a Japanese American pr perspective, there were so many similarities between the cases of Korematsu and the, the travel ban. Right. And that um, um, in, in, in the case of both of them, the government was claiming military necessity or national security as a reason, but it was like this thinly veiled facade behind discrimination. Um, and so two years ago, um, you know, the, uh, the ruling came out and, and Chief Justice Roberts um, actually in his decision, you know, to his credit, repudiated Korematsu. He says Korematsu was this horrible decision that we all know was racist and, and that's not who we are. And, um, but then right after he said that, he said, um, but what we're doing with Muslims is very different. And th this is where I would you know, beg to differ with Chief Justice um, Roberts, where he said they were different. Um, he didn't really get that in 1942, um, the government actually used national security for the reason, not dis discrimination. And they're doing the same thing with the Muslims. So, so that's you know the the similarities. It was really hard. You know, I, I actually brought up a a a picture that uh, and, and Terry, I think this might have been the first time we uh, uh, let me see share screen. Maybe this, oh maybe it's not working under this right now. Anyway, it was a picture of us. Oh, here it goes. So he, this is actually, I think, the day after the uh, the ruling. And and, yes. and and Terry, you're you're up here. If you see my my yeah. uh, here, sir. And and it, it was such a, a powerful event for uh, I think for all of us yes. to be on the courts of the Kenzo Nakamura Federal Courthouse, yes. uh, a Japanese American who was incarcerated, who later on uh, fought for the. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the U.S. Army. He actually was killed in action um, about the same time as my uncle that I talked about earlier. Yes. Because the memorial service that I, I mentioned was also a memorial service for Kenzo Nakamura. Wow. Um, and, uh, and here we are um, you know, on the steps. And here I am you know, talking about you know, the, um, the similarities between Korematsu yes. and Taliban and how wrong that was. But the, the beauty of this... Of this um, of this event was how quickly the faith community and others came together uh, in support of uh, Anila, who's in the lower right-hand corner. She's you know, uh, you know sort of off, almost off screen, but uh, and the other you know Muslims uh, who we had um, you know known and and supported. And so this was a, an opportunity for us to to come and show our support. And I think the other thing I, I mentioned um, as I was speaking is it was so important for us to be there because. You know, 79 years ago, when uh, Japanese Americans were being rounded up, uh, there were no allies uh, right. for the Japanese American community. Yes. And today we have the opportunity to be the allies that Japanese Americans didn't have so that these same things don't happen again. Amen.